Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Best of Pedal Shift. On this edition, we go all the way back to April of 2018 for the continuation of the Beginner Series with our old friend James, not Mysterious James, other James, uh, as he was preparing to train for his first real big bike tour. This is a one of many of this year's best ofs where we're going to be revisiting the Beginner Series. And during this winter season, it's always something we're thinking about with training. So that is a major component to all of this. And we also talk a little bit about raising funds for your ride if it has a charitable component. We do talk about James's ride. Of course, it's well in the past, many years ago. Um, if there's any references to Ride for Cora, um, it was successful, did really good, but um, don't need to give any money to it because it's already happened. All right. <laughs> Hope you enjoy. <laughs> Well, I figure we'll just jump right into it because you are nearing, you're getting closer. You're done with work. How was that? How was wrapping all of that up? Oh, it was awesome. It's, you know, the first time in a while that I've had no responsibilities. And especially like the last two weeks of working, people just stop giving you projects. You know, you can show up a little late, leave a little early, happy hours every day. It's a good feeling. That is that that is a good feeling. It's like, you know, the old senioritis kind of vibe and everything like that. In college, I got senioritis a little bit. At my job, I got it so hard. Yeah, well, especially because you've got so many great things to look forward to. Obviously, the trip that you're on right now, but also, of course, the bike tour, too. So I figure we we're, we can jump right into sort of the topics du jour for this month. We, we're talking about two things to talk about. We'll kick it off with the first one, training when you can't bike, or whether it's due to travel or weather. I assume you are in that situation right now. Is that right? I am in that situation right now. Definitely, I was not able to bring my bike with me over here. Have you considered, I, depending on where you're at, is it easy to get bike rentals or anything like that? Have you thought about it, what you would do, or are you just, I am off the bike for this period of time? So that's actually one of the things I was going to say is everywhere around here, especially, you can easily rent a bike. And it actually turns out it's a much cooler way to see a lot of the sites is by bicycle. You know, I went to Angkor Wat the other day, which is the largest religious monument in the world. And I went two different days. The first day I went on like a guided tour. We were there for probably six hours, ended up seeing only three temples. And it was really cool. But by the end, I was clawing my eyes out of boredom. But then the next day I went back, just rented a bicycle and kind of pedaled my way around. And I spent another six hours there and saw probably 15 different temples, just went at my own pace, saw what I wanted to see. I mean, it, it was awesome. The only downside is by the time it hits two o'clock here, it's about 100 degrees out. So it ends up being a, a bit harder of a ride on the way home than on the way there. Dude, it's like a sauna therapy kind of thing. You know, you're, it, it, it's a specialized <laughs> kind of training, right? <laughs> That's funny. I've definitely sweat out some weight this trip. Uh, it, it, longtime listeners of the pod know that is precisely the type of weather that just deactivates me. I am unable to bicycle in that kind of weather. So my hat is tipped to you for even giving that a shot. That's awesome. <laughs> when it comes to training, I thought that maybe I would start by broadening the topic a little bit and then narrowing it into your very specific question. Because I think think for a lot of people in the bicycle touring context, there is a school of thought that says that training itself for a bike tour is overrated. And these are the folks that suggest that you can ride yourself into shape. I don't necessarily subscribe to that myself. I was going to say, I think those are the folks that are already in pretty good shape. Well, sometimes yes. And sometimes they're people who are in utterly not good shape and, you know, they're proud of that and they, they literally will ride themselves into shape. I think it's a less than ideal strategy for a variety of reasons because I think that if you're going in, it's if you're going into any kind of physical activity cold, the odds of injury are just a lot higher. So I think doing some kind of training ahead of any kind of a bike tour is a really, I think it's important to do. Whether or not mm -hmm. I think that you need to be like as prepared like as a marathon runner is ahead of a marathon, like, you know, you're amping up your miles and, you know, you're getting into a cool down and all, you know, or taper and all that other kind of stuff. I don't think that's as necessary, especially because you do, I, I think there is 
some method to the madness for the people that do ride themselves into shape. I mean, by the time you are, you know, a few weeks into your ride, you really do hit a rhythm. So I, I think that it's not unreasonable for people to think about that. I think that this somewhere in the middle is probably the best way to do it. I'll tell you a couple of things that I do think is important broadly, and then again, I'll bring it all back to uh, <laughs> the, the the more specific question. I think the most important things to do in terms of training is mentally getting used to time in the saddle. I think that is, for most people in bike touring, that is the hardest thing in, in, at all. Most people that I encounter don't get super tired. They don't get, you know, their legs don't hurt. You know, it's just that long constant physical activity and that if you're not used to being in the saddle for six, seven, eight hours total in a day, that's the type of thing that really gets to people when all is said and done. And there's also the the element of sort of saddle tours and things like that are based on repetitive stress in, well, that area. So I think that's also a piece that goes with it. So there, it's it's mental and physical at the same time, but getting used to time in the saddle is, I think, the number one thing that you, you want to be ready for. It sounds like there's really no alternative to, to getting ready, I guess, in that regards than just being in the saddle for six, seven, eight hours uh, on a couple given days. Or are there other ways that you found can prepare you for that? No, I think you hit the nail on the head. That's the paradox is that the only real way to get ready for bike touring is by bike touring <laughs> in some ways, <laughs> at least on this type of a thing. I, I would say that one thing that you can really do is to f- – it- it- not now, but, you know, find time to do some really long rides. Uh, for a lot of people who are mm-hmm. first timers, they just don't know what it's like to be in the saddle for that long. And then, you know, you do it a day, maybe two days, and then so- there's a monotony to it. And you do have to learn to lean into it a little bit. And I think the only real way to do it is to have some really long rides. That said, that's not everything. The second thing that I think is really important, especially for a ride that you're going to be tackling, is that you should be doing some hill training. I trained mileage, but not hills, when I did my first really big tour in the Northern California coast. And it, it while the mileage and getting used to being in the saddle was really helpful, it, when I hit the first bunch of hills, I just wasn't prepared for them. And later I discovered that my bicycle was not geared properly for it. I had a bike that was much better for flats and for trails and stuff like that, but not for the kinds of hills that you're going to be climbing. So the one thing that I would say for you, again, not now, not on this trip, but you know, when you're getting back into the scheme of things leading up to kind of day zero, day one, is to try and get out and find some hilly rides as much as you can. Because especially early on, when you're going to be going through Kentucky and, you know, the Ozarks in Missouri, that's some really crazy up and downs on the Trans Am. So that's something that you want to at least have experienced a little bit. It doesn't mean that you need to be doing it all the time. You can simulate it at the gym sometimes, but there's really nothing quite like having the visual of a hill coming up and going up that hill and spinning up it and then coming down and doing all of that. So that's the two basic things that I think are the most important in terms of training for a first timer in particular, but really, frankly, anyone. That hill piece is actually really interesting because to your point, my plan was when I get back home was just to start putting in mileage. You know, wherever I can ride. I, mean, I never once, it never once crossed my mind, you know, hey, maybe you should go up a hill now or now and again. So that is definitely something I will switch up a little bit. I would really recommend it. You're in New York City, so I would say get up into Westchester, get up to Nyack, you know, get get into some places where you've got the opportunity to hit some hills because it's going to pay dividends for you later on. As I said, there are portions of your ride that, you know, everybody focuses then on the Rockies for the Trans Am. But it's the Appalachians is what I heard. Yeah. Appalachians and the Ozarks. Those are the two that are the real tricky ones because they're short, they're steep, and they're freaking numerous. <laughs> Again, <laughs> I haven't ridden the Trans Am in that area, but I've ridden in that in, in the Appalachians and elsewhere. So I, I would say that's the hardest type of hill for me, at least, is the sort of you don't get a rhythm. It, you know, roll, rollers are great and you can find those in a lot of different places on your ride. And those are fun because you can get enough momentum from your downhill to really attack the uphill. And then it just keeps going and going. When you're fully loaded, it's harder to do that than on, you know, some cool zippy little skinny tired racing bike. But at the same time, you know, you can leverage that 
the physics of that a little bit, even in a loaded touring situation. In the Appalachians and the Ozarks, it's straight up spin, coast down, try to get a little bit of momentum, and then you're going to be spinning again in your first gear or your low gear. So I, that's the type of thing that you want to be able to get used to because that can be the most exhausting 40 miles you put in on a day like that will be so much harder for you than a century that you might do that's, you know, wind aided with a tailwind in Kansas at some point. Um, it, it, it's pretty remarkable how different that is. So I would say, um, get some hills in as soon as you can. And I think you'll be happier for it. You may realize that you're like, oh, wait, I'm not in as good of a place as I thought I was, <laughs> you know, um, but that's good because frankly, it's better to have that now rather than later. I was going to say, I'm, I'm hoping for that realization pretty soon um, to kick my butt into gear a little bit. Yeah, no, I feel you. As far as the uh, non-bicycle training goes, so what can you do now? I mean, I think getting on a bike at all at, during this period is a good idea. But, you know, generally speaking, when you're traveling or there's bad weather and you can't get out on a bike or whatever, actually, first thing I would say is I would get out in some bad weather on the bike. You're going to be facing it anyways. It's a good opportunity to test your ring gear and things like that. Test your cold gear because depending on conditions, you may end up having some cold weather as well. And, you know, you should be prepared for that. So I would be ready. Don't let being on the tour be the first time you ever test out that gear because it's a different type of riding and it's good to it's good to have a headwind it's good to have bad weather and bad rain i just did a tour in washington state where i had a whole lot of that and it's it's a little bit miserable at times but at the same time you know once you conquer something like that you're not afraid of it just like with hills you know once you conquer some of the bigger hills you're not afraid of them anymore it just sounds like the the best approach is try and simulate simulate wow Everything that you you know you're going to hit, whether it's hills, bad weather, long days in the saddle, whatever it is, get out there and do as much of that as you can before the ride. So that way you're, you're used to it. It's not the first time that you see anything is when you're in the middle of a long trip. That's how you would put it in, in short. Yeah. I think that one other thing that I would throw in there is don't underestimate how much exposure to the sun in particular can just zap you. Some people really thrive on it. It's like they're a freaking solar battery. Some people like me, I mean, I get exposed to a little bit too much sun and, you know, it's like I'm riding an extra 20 miles or more. It's really wild how that can really affect you. So know what the sun exposure can do to you and then, you know, adjust accordingly. There are these really inexpensive um, sun sleeves that are really great for keeping sun off of you and they cool you down. And I, I find them to be totally important to have um, when I'm out on open road areas um, where there's not a lot of cover, when I know I'm going to be exposed to a lot of sun. So, you know, being prepared for that kind of stuff is almost as important in the training perspective as being out there on the road, because once you get used to it in the training perspective, again, you know what you've got going for you when you're out on the road. But I think that, you know, to really more directly answer the question was, uh, would be uh, quads and hamstrings, I think are probably, you know, if, if you're, if you've got access to a gym or something like that, I, you can't go wrong doing some weight training on the legs. It's not, it's not going to be exactly right on, but at least you're doing something to keep your muscle mass going and all of that. I don't think it's necessary, but I think it's helpful, um, especially if you're the type of person that if you lose a little momentum in the workout regimen, doing that can stop the slide, then I would say go for it. Cardio, it's interesting. A lot of people are big on cardio. I find that I don't rely on cardio health a lot when it comes to bicycle touring. I'm very rarely out of breath. Yeah, and and that's an experience that uh, I keep citing the other James, Mysterious James, my buddy. He's the same way. He's like, I, I'm never out of breath doing stuff. You certainly can get in a situation where you would be. You know, if you're standing at, on your pedals and going up a hill that way, yeah, sure. But for the most part, it's slow and steady wins the race thing with bicycle touring. And there may be folks out there who are listening to the pod right now going, wait, I'm constantly constantly out of breath. I, I need cardio for everything. So it just is your mileage may vary on that. But I find for myself, cardio is not super important. That actually makes me feel a, a whole lot better because joining that with your, your point about the sun, one of my first days over here, I got the worst sunburn of my life. Mm. So my original plan had been to run every morning that I woke up and get my cardio in shape. But 
from this sunburn, I could not run. It was just way too painful. So kind of knowing that cardio maybe is a little less important definitely makes me feel better about it. But also knowing that the sun and I don't mix too well. So definitely going to follow your advice on getting those sun sleeves and kind (laughs) of any other advice you got is definitely much appreciated in that regards. Yeah, protecting yourself from the sun, I think, can be a really helpful thing, especially during some of the stretches that you're going to be having where there's just no relief from it. It's It can be really helpful to have that kind of gear ready for you. I think cardio is the, the only reason why car- cardio might be helpful is, you know, if you're someone like me who, you know, during the winter season, I tend to put on a few pounds that I tend to lose once the good weather comes about, you know, if it, any weight that you're not carrying on you is less weight that you have to haul around. So if, you know, I, I, for me, that means losing a few pounds going into touring season is always the best bet for me. So that's what I would say. Watch your diet too. Um, everybody's system is different. For me, I can't have sugar anymore, basically. If I have sugar, I put on weight. I feel I feel lousy. It's just no good for me. So I try to watch my diet as best I can going into touring season. Try to do it all the time. But, you know, that's another thing that you'll probably want to look at. And, you know, not knowing what your system is like, you know, you know your body better than me, obviously. So, you know, try to focus on giving yourself the type of fuel and food that's going to be good for you. You know, right now you're enjoying Thailand, so you should enjoy the heck out of that. But, you know, when you get back home, you know, focus on the stuff that's going to help fuel you in the right way in terms of training. And then that's going to pay dividends for you down the line. Definitely. Yeah, that's something that I was trying to figure out before this trip. But (laughs) right now it's definitely been a bit of a challenge when I don't actually know what I'm eating half the time. (laughs) This morning I walked out to the little market and I just pointed at a couple different meat skewers. And it turns out I got chicken livers. Was not ready for that at all. But, you know, it's definitely harder to regulate the uh, the diet here. But, you know, trying to figure that out for sure in the, in the long run, you know, how much sugar is a good amount of sugar versus protein versus carbs versus all that. Yeah. And what's interesting is when you're on the bike, it all goes to hell because, you know, what you have available to you is often pretty limited. You're sitting in, at a gas station going, I know I should eat something healthy, but there are Cheetos here, you know, and I'm hungry, you know. <laughs> I used to be a long distance runner. And one of the quotes that we always referenced was, if the furnace is hot enough, anything will burn, even a Big Mac. There you go. That's true. I think that is true. <laughs> You'll find yourself at a lot of fast food places and taking advantage of their Wi-Fi and taking advantage of their incredibly high caloric meals. So <laughs> <laughs> Got it. I'm with you on that. So any other questions on training in general, but especially this sort of like away from the bike kind of training? No more questions. I did have one another point that I actually wanted to raise. And it was just the the importance of walking. One thing that I noticed was, you know, if you're on vacation, and you don't take cabs, you don't take public transportation, you really walk everywhere, you end up putting in 10 or 15 miles a day, just walking around. And, you know, the first couple days here, my legs were actually really sore from that. So it's a great way to get in shape while also seeing the city. So my one little beginner's piece of advice there would be definitely walk around as much as you can. You know, Don't take the shortcut of a cab or an Uber. You see more of the city, and it really does seem to help you get into much better shape. Yeah, I think that's really good. And it's good cross-training, too, because they are slightly different muscles. And, you know, it's it everything counts. Everything counts. That's the best. Exactly. Part. All right, so let's move on to the second topic for the month, and that is fundraising goals and woes. And I think that this is a really excellent topic because I think that you're in the kind of the final stretch for the early type of fundraising. And I come from a world of sort of campaign stuff. I used to do election law when I was doing more uh, lawyerly work back in the day. And uh, Emily's List is a pretty famous uh, organization, and their their kind of tagline is, early money is like yeast, it raises the dough. And I've always loved that line because I think that's so true for all types of fundraising. So I think that your number one goal is, you know, just like anybody else is look inside your social circle. So, you know, your friends, your family, your friends of friends, things like that. I think that the nice thing about social media these days is that we have an automatic group of hundreds, sometimes thousands of people that, you know, we can communicate with, you know, really quickly and easily. And I think that's so much better than where people were before social media. You know, you didn't have the opportunity to reach 
folks like that. So I think that's obviously your first group of, of people to look at. Maybe your former coworkers, things like that. But I think that's where your focus is going to want to be. Obviously, one nice thing about being on a show like this is you're reaching outside of that circle as well. So to the extent that you can do things like, you know, be in a beginner series of a podcast about bicycle touring, you know, people will hear about it. So if you've got, you can plug away, we'll get links in the show notes for uh, any fundraising uh, stuff that you have set up already. But I think also I got an email and I shared it with you uh, already uh, from the end of last month from friend of the show and Pedal Shift Society member Ethan Georgie. He, he brought up a really good point that I wanted to reiterate to you here and also, to, you know, for purposes of the pod here. Ethan wrote, years ago, I backed Russ and Laura, but they are of the Pathless Pedaled, who was, Russ, of course, was on a past show recently. Years ago, I backed Russ and Laura on Indiegogo and they sent me a postcard and some knickknacks from the road. Still have that stuff way better than an Instagram post. And I think that Ethan raises a really good point about personalizing the fundraising as much as you can. And so there's one piece, but I think the other piece is creating a higher end kind of experience for donors versus your social media followers. So you're going to be doing stuff on your social media feed, you know, for exposure for all sorts of other stuff. And there's all sorts of good reasons why that's going to be helpful from a fundraising perspective because people will discover you through social media, et cetera, et cetera. But what you might want to consider doing is doing what Russ and Laura did, and that is saying, okay, if you uh, promise to support me through whatever mechanism that you have, then I will send you a postcard, or at least one postcard from the road. And if you support me at this level, then you'll get a postcard and you'll get something else. You know, making a tiered system, which is exactly how these, you know, uh, Indiegogo and some of these, all the variety of different sort of Patreon kind of things are all set up. And you know, get creative with that because, you know, you've got a variety of things that you can do. I mean, something as simple as, you know, a personalized direct message from a, a particular spot on the road or something along those lines or, you know, you know, sponsoring a day of your ride. There's all sorts of different things that you can do to sort of hook up a donation level with an individual and then give something back to them that's very personalized based on that. So, you know, back in the day, it was postcards and knickknacks. These days, it could be something even more than that. It just depends on your creativity and how you want to go about doing that. Have you thought about doing anything like the like that for fundraising, or have you already implemented something like that? So I've been thinking about it, and to be honest, I have not implemented anything. But I want to do a, a combination of the two things that you mentioned, of the kind of postcards and knickknacks, as well as the kind of technological approach. I think one thing that Ethan had mentioned was a postcard is something that you can keep and you can relook at where an Instagram post or a Facebook message or, or status or whatever is really something you're going to see once and, and probably forget about. So I want to do something where it's the low level is going to be something social media related, whether it's, you know, being called out in an Instagram post. I like the idea that you just mentioned of, of sponsoring a day. But I think at the higher level, it, it really does come down to that personalized whether it's a postcard, whether it's a knickknack from the trail, whether it's both or multiple. I think that's what I want to get to is something that people are able to receive, physically touch, and then look back and at a later time. Yeah, there's something that's really helpful about having something tangible because this is – the thing that's cool about a bicycle tour is that you are literally going to be touching in a very thin line, <laughs> uh, you know, from one coast to the other. And, you know, to be able to give someone a piece of that experience, even if it's just, you know, putting pen to postcard or, you know, getting a paperweight at, you know, next to the world's biggest ball of twine or whatever, you know, something like that, that can be really cool and powerful. There's also folks that have done this ride before and might be interested in doing some kind of support for your ride, and they may have really fond memories of a particular spot. So, you know, hooking into that kind of a thing, you know, saying, hey, have you d have you done the ride before? You know, do you have a favorite spot? You know, if so, I'll send you a postcard from that spot, your favorite spot. You know, finding ways to personalize it and individualize it. And then also, especially folks who are veterans always love to show the ropes of folks who are doing it for the first time. So they may say, hey, you got to stop here and get a piece of pie at this place, you know, and you could say, OK, well, you know, I'll get a piece of pie and take a picture of it and send it to you. You, you know, if you support my ride, the thing I, that is totally off the top of my head. I really like that idea, though. I think 
an option for us is, you know, I, I've got this website set up, the, the Ride for Cora website, and just adding another tab that says, you know, done this before or any advice or anything like that kind of just feeds into exactly what you're talking about. You know, is there a spot on the ride that they want to recommend? Is there a place they want to get a postcard from? Did they really wish they got a souvenir from one place that they didn't or, or something like that? And tap into it that way. I think that would be a really neat idea. And I, I really like that a lot. Yeah. People really love living vicariously through other people's tours. And I think it it only gets more intense after somebody's done that tour before. Um, every time I read about people riding down the Oregon coast or in Northern California or something like that, I've ridden that oh easily a half a dozen times in, in various capacities. But it's always it i never get sick of talking about it i never get sick of, of hearing people telling stories about how they saw uh roosevelt elk at elk prairie at, at dusk you know it's like oh yeah that's so great that's the other thing is i think it, it's just such a good opportunity to get a blog online um so one of the things that i'm trying to do is at the end of every day sit down and, and rehash what happened throughout the day because to your point a lot of people either have done this before and want to see it done again or have never done it before and, and likely won't have the opportunity to do it. So they want to live through the one experience that I'm having. So, you know, I think what's going to be really powerful is just writing about it, letting people live through it while they're not there. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And then, you know, linking that into sort of the fundraising goals and, you know, linking those things together because then you have something that's really powerful because you're going to be doing the, – the ride has a great charitable component to it, and that alone is going to be enough for people to want to support that. But if you can link all of these things together, then you get this great synergistic vibe where – Folks will be interested in supporting the charitable cause, but also they're getting that little something else. They're really linking into all of that. And I think that is the real sweet spot from a fundraising perspective. And also it helps you enjoy the ride a little bit more because you're able to make that connection with the people who are supporting doing what you're doing and for the goals that you have from a charitable perspective too. So you get that really nice meeting of the minds that way. That's so true. And I think one of the other things is, you know, when I first started this, my thought was, this is, you know, a really good cause. People are going to want to support it. And uh, I sent it out to everyone that I work with my last day of work. I did your typical goodbye email, but then I also included some bits about the ride and saying, hey, you know, y'all should support this. And, you know, got such great feedback and everything, but not as many donations as I was expecting. And I realized that a lot of it is there are just so many great causes out there that you can't support everything or you'd have nothing left in your own bank account. So finding a way to take this cause and, and make it a little bit more personal. I think that's really what kind of drives the successful fundraising. Rather than just having a good cause, you need to have a great cause and something on top of it. I think that's exactly the right way to look at it. And it's also good because I, if, it sounds like that you've got really reasonable expectations with how this is going to all go. I've known some people who had really lofty ambitions for their rides in terms of what they were going to raise and what they were going to do, only to find themselves a little disappointed by the response that they got. So I think that it's important to keep grounded in all that, know that whatever you do, it's going to make a difference for the cause that you're supporting and, you know, see how it goes. You, you may be surprised that as time goes on, that it's, it catches a wind, your sail catches the wind and to mix a metaphor about 17 different ways. But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, I, I think that the charitable bike tours are really great ways to do it and they're the Elements of going across the country um, for a cause is something that's been done by bike, by running, by all sorts of different things. And, you know, people get it and people link into it. And then also people like find that your ride has maybe a more purpose of nobility other than just a physical challenge for yourself or something for you to, you know, tick off the, the bucket list or whatever. Um, it, it adds on to that. And I think that's really important, too. Definitely. And I think the other thing is, you know, we've talked a lot about how to get your network to donate. But one of the things that I want to do is get, as I'm riding across meeting people, trying to get, you know, them to throw in some money as well. And doing the, the Barack Obama 2008 approach of $5 here, $5 there is, you know, it can end up being a huge sum at the end of the day, rather than just focusing on one person who can donate $50 or whatever it is. So I've, started designing some business cards that I'll have with me on the rides that way. 
you know, as you're talking to somebody, they say, oh, wow, that's so cool that you're doing this. But then they get in their car and they forget about you or they remember you, but they don't remember the website. So just having a card that you can hand them and say, hey, you know, by the way, here's the website. If you want to learn some more information, it just gives them that one little bit of reminder to say, hey, maybe I should go to that website. And here's what it is. So I, I can donate to the cause. Yeah, I think that's great. And I've also seen people do things like, you know, have signs on their panniers and all sorts of things to websites and it, it all every way that you can choose to communicate that all helps and it'll draw attention to even more attention than being the crazy guy on the in the three and a half foot shoulder on a u.s highway in the middle of nowhere <laughs> exactly yeah definitely i just have to be a little shameless in it so i'm gonna throw in my shameless plug right now uh, that's you know the website is rideforcora.com that's r-i-d-e-f-o-r-k-o-r-e.com so if any listeners want to support It'd be much appreciated. And definitely, you know, as we talked about, we'll definitely be writing postcards and sending out some knickknacks to everybody who has the time. That's awesome. And we'll, of course, have that in the show notes at pedalshift.net slash 113, which is the show notes for this episode. Hey, remind us, when are you wheels down? What's the schedule? So the tentative start date is May 8th. However, I am actually thinking about pushing that up a little bit. My school starts on August 19th. So I want to have a little bit of time after the tour just to relax a little bit, get back into normal life. I think one of the things that I've learned from listening to this show a lot is that you need a little bit of adjustment time after a tour. So just having an extra week might be helpful. So I might push it up to April 29th. I think that's a pretty smart idea. So hopefully you and I will get at least one more edition of the uh, beginner series, maybe within a few days ahead of your start. Does that work for you? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, All right. We'll love to fill you in as I'm making those final preparations and get my final questions answered. <laughs> there's, uh, Yeah, I was just going to say there's always those last minute things. So we'll schedule up one more edition of the Beginner Series with you. And of course, we'll be in touch throughout your tour as well. So good luck on everything. Good luck on the fundraising. Good luck on keeping your diet in check here in Thailand for the next, how long, much longer are you there? So I'm in Thailand for another week, but then I've got one week in Sri Lanka. Uh, so two more weeks till I'm back in the States. That's fantastic. Well, enjoy the heck out of that. And we will be in touch again at the end of April for the final edition of the Beginner Series. Great. Well, thanks a lot, Tim. Look forward to it. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net for more great bicycle touring content. You can hear the Pedal Shift Project through Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his self-titled album, track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Mono, wherever cool music is available.